Hello everyone. So far, we have been talking about the early phase of Sanskrit literary theory. In this lecture, we are going to understand the state of Sanskrit poetics in the medieval phase. From around the 13th century CE onwards, the second phase in the history of Sanskrit Kavya Shastra, which we can call the medieval phase, begins. We can safely consider the 17th century as the point at which the medieval phase of Sanskrit poetics ends. The 17th century is considered the closing period of the medieval phase precisely because it marks the beginning of colonialism, uh, thereby inaugurating a new phase for literary theory. It is important to note that despite the strong influence of vernacular literature during this phase, Sanskrit Kavya Shastra continued to produce new treatises, thereby ensuring the continuum of this great lineage dating back to the 7th century CE. Some of the major Kavya Shastra texts that were composed in this phase include Singapuvala's Rasarnava Sudagara, Bhanudatta's Alankara Tilaga, Rasamanjari and Rasatarangani, Ruba Goswami's Nataka Chandriga, Prabhagara Bhatta's uh, Rasapradipa, Keshava Mishra's Alangara Shekhara, Appaya Dikshida's Kuvalayananda and Chitrami Mamsa, Jagannatha's Rasa Gangathara and Vishweshara Pandita's Alangara Kaustupa, Rasa Chandrika, Alangara Deepika and Alankara Muktavali. The criticism that was conventionally directed against Sanskrit poetics in the medieval phase was that there was nothing worth mentioning uh, happening in Sanskrit literary theory during the medieval period. For scholars like S.K. Dey, the medieval phase was a period of mere imitation and restatement of the old critical idioms. But scholars like Egal Bronner shows us that Sanskrit poetics in the medieval phase was equally innovative and powerful. Browner in his article, What is New and What is Navya, Sanskrit Poetics on the Eve of Colonialism, says that medieval phase is particularly characterized by two events. One, a methodological change in the approach of Sanskrit Kavi Shastra and the other, the emergence of vernacular literature and poetics. First, Let's see what this change in methodology means. According to Bronner, the literary theoreticians in the medieval phase attempted to constitute a new relationship with their past. That is to say, instead of inventing any radically new critical concept like Thwani or Vakrokti, they directed their energy mainly to critically examine the views of their predecessors and to answer the old questions in new ways, to mark their departure from their predecessors in terms of their mode of operation and views, these new poeticians often identified themselves as Navyas or neo-intellectuals, in contrast to their predecessors who they called Prachinas. A case in point is Jagannatha's debate on the causes of Rasa Bhasa or the semblance of Rasa in Kavya in Rasa Gangathara. According to the Prajinas or ancients, a woman having multiple male partners is not a case of Rasa Bhasa if she is married to them. But for Navyas like Jagannatha, this is a clear case of Rasa Bhasa. Therefore, he says that Draupadi's love for her five husbands unlike what, is, what his predecessors think, is a clear case of Rasa Bhasa. If you do not understand this concept of Rasa Bhasa, you don't need to worry now. We will take this up in a separate video soon. So, Jagannatha's Rasa Gangathara is in fact replete with such refutations and reconsiderations of the theory of his predecessors. One such instance of critical dissent in Rasa Gangathara revolves around the question of whether Bhakti should be considered a tenth Rasa. Rejecting the position of his Vaishnavite predecessors like Rupa Goswami, Kavi Karnapura and many others, Jagannatha says that Bhakti cannot be considered 
erasa as it is against the dictum of writers like Bharata. In the Sagangathara, Jagannatha also takes his predecessors like Appaya Dikshida to task for introducing a new subspecies of the figure of speech, denial or apaknudi in Kuvalayananda. According to Jagannatha, the proposed subtype cannot be considered a subcategory of apaknudi or denial as it is not covered by the definition of the category given in Kavya Prakasha, Alankara Sarvaswa, and Appaya Dikshida's own Chitra Mimamsa. The other predecessors with whom Jagannatha expresses his difference of opinion in Rasagangathara include Anandavarthana, Vidyanatha, Shobhakaramitra, Jayaratha, Ruyaka, and Mamada. Siddha Chandra's Kavya Prakasha Khandana, Appaya Dikshida's Chitra Mimamsa, and Kuvalayananda, and Jagannatha's Chitra Mimamsa Khandana are a few other remarkable treatises from the medieval phase which aims to constitute this new relation with uh, their past either by questioning the claims of their predecessors or by trying to answer questions which the Prajinas have left unanswered. Siddha Chandra's Kavya Prakasha Khandana and Jagannatha's Chitra Mimamsa Khandana are self-evidently the criticisms of Mamada's Kavya Prakasha and Appaya Dikshida's Chitra Mimamsa. In Chitra Mimamsa, Appaya Dikshida innovatively redefines the figure of speech called Upama or Simili. Appaya sees Simili as the archetypal Alankara that functions as the base of all figures of speech. He envisions Simili as the one and only actress on the stage of Kavya. Although Appaya is not the first critic to grant such a status to Simili, the way he conceives Simili is something distinct from his predecessors. <laughs> Acknowledging the potency of Simili to generate other Alankaras, Appaya compares Simili to the concept of Brahman in the phenomenal world. Just as Brahman takes on various shapes, so also Upama in the figurative realm assumes the shape of different figures of speech. The way he presents Upama in Chitrami Mamsa is also in conjunction with his Vedantic disposition of the same. Until Appaya's intervention, there had been an unwritten rule in literary science that while presenting a figure of speech, one should necessarily define it first. Appaya departs from this age-old practice by not defining what Upama is. This is to send a message that just as the essence of Brahman defines all ontological specificities, so also Upama refuses to be reduced to one particular definition. In his introduction, Apaya states that his definitions and illustrations are mostly drawn from the works of the ancients or Prajinas like uh, Mammata, Vidyanatha, Thoja and Ruyaga. But as soon as his discussion begins, we learn that his invocation of the views of the ancients is not to blindly follow them, but to challenge and modify them. These uh, instances of disagreements clearly show that the Sanskrit literary theoreticians were attempting to constitute a new relation with their predecessors by questioning the latter's view or by building upon what they have already said. Another significant characteristic underpinning this space is the great influence that Sanskrit Kavi Shastra exercised upon vernacular poetics. Almost all Bhashas that produced treatises on literary science in the medieval phase drew considerable inspiration and influence from Sanskrit Kavi Shastra. G. N. Devi's observation in his After Amnesia is not worthy in this context. According to Devi, the impact of Sanskrit poetics upon uh, vernacular poetics was so strong that the vernacular languages failed to produce an indigenous tradition of Kavya Shastra independent of their Sanskritic counterpart. According to Devi, uh, the temporal sequence of events in the process of transition ought to have been this. First, the decline of Sanskrit as a literary language. Then the emergence of uh, the Pashas, 
then the decline of Sanskrit poetics and finally the emergence of Pasha criticism. But this logical sequence of events was defied completely when Pasha literatures did not produce any theory on their own. The two most important deviations from this logical sequence that Devi notes are these. First, Sanskrit poetics does not show signs of decline several centuries after the emergence of Pasha criticism. And second, no significant criticism in the Pasha traditions is in evidence. One of the many vernacular traditions of poetics which inclined towards Sanskrit poetics was the earliest form of Malayalam literary language known as Manipravalam. Leela Tilakam, the Lakshana Grantha or the treatise that sets down the rules of Manipravalam is very much modeled on uh, the tradition of Sanskrit poetics. Like Sanskrit poetics which aims to create a translocal language for Kavya, Leela Tilakam also generates a trans-regional literary language by mixing Sanskrit and Kerala Bhasha. Leela Tilakam defines the literary language of Manipravalam as a blending of Sanskrit and Kerala Bhasha. Bhasha Samskrita Yogo Manipravalam. This tendency of standardizing a specific language for literary production is something that Leela Tilakam directly derives from Sanskrit poetics. According to Pamaha, the author of Kavya Lankara, Sanskrit, Prakrit and Abhabhramsha are the only three languages fit for literary production. The same is the opinion of Dandin, the author of Kavya Prakasha, who further elaborates on this topic. According to Dandin, uh, among the various regional dialects of Prakrit, only Maharashtri Prakrit is suitable for literary production. Although the term Abhabhramsha denotes any usage that deviates from the standard variety of Sanskrit, uh, the variety of Abhabhramsha that Dandin prescribes for composing Kavya is the Abhabhramsha variety used by cowherds and others. Uh, through this process of reserving certain languages for the production of literature, Sanskrit poetics not only standardized the language of literary production, but also made the literary production a very unique translocal phenomenon for a translocal public. The same tendency can be seen in Leela Tilakam, which reserves a hybrid language for literature through the rule-based mixture of Pasha and Sanskrit. There is evidently a stamp of Sanskrit literary theory in every aspect of Kavya that Leela Tilakam deals with. Rich Freeman in his article uh, Genre and Society, the Literary Culture of Pre-Modern Kerala observes that Leela Tilakam applies all of the technical apparatus of Sanskrit literary treatise that process mundane language into poetry. A quick glance at the observation of the unknown author of Leela Tilakam about the body of literature will show the influence of Sanskrit literary theory upon the vernacular poetics. The unknown author of Manipravalam observes that Manipravalam has sharira or body, doshas or poetic faults, guna or poetic excellence, alankaras or figures of speech and atma or soul. The body is composed of bhashas and Sanskrit. The doshas are cacophony, etc. The gunas are sweetness, etc. Alankaras are upama, anuprasa, etc. Rasas like shringara make its soul. This comparison of Kavya Sharira to a human body is something which uh, the Sanskrit literary theoretician had originally started. Out of the eight shilpas or chapters in Leela Tilakam, all the other shilpas except the first three are very much founded on Sanskrit poetics. The fourth shilpa deals with the doshas, the fifth one with gunas, the sixth one with the shabdalankaras, the seventh one with the arthalankara and the eighth one with rasas. Malayalam is not an exception in this respect about the influence of Sanskrit literary theory upon the production of Kavya in classical Kannada, Dr. Nagaraj in his article Critical Tensions in the History of Kannada Literature observes that 
Sanskrit was not only the language of the gods. It also behaved like a god itself. By the time the Kavira Jamarga appeared on the scene, the attempt to create a vernacular double of Sanskrit was at its peak. The same was the case with languages like Braj Bhasha, which imbibed considerably from Sanskrit poetics to form its vernacular counterpart. Alison Bush, in her article The Anxiety of Innovation, the practice of literary science in the Hindi or Rithi tradition says, for all their apparent radicalism in eschewing the time-honored language of courtly intellectual life and the trumpeting of their vernacular works as new theorizations, many early Braj Bhasha scholars insist that they have not departed from existing Sanskrit tradition. According to Bush, uh, one of the primary sources of inspiration for Keshavadasa's Kavipriya, his manual for poets in Braj Bhasha, is undoubtedly Dandin's Kavyadarsha. His Rasika Priya, yet another work of literary science, is modeled on Rudra Bhatta's Shringaratilaga. Bush further says, at first glance, the Rasika Priya appears to be a very close adaptation of Shringaratilaga or the ornament of passion by the Sanskrit the rhetorician Rudra Bhatta. Keshavdas follows virtually the same order of treatment of the subject matter as his source and significant lexical borrowings uh, in the definition of verses show his reliance upon Rudra Bhatta's to be beyond doubt. Chindamani Tribadi, one of the major intellectuals to emerge after Keshavdas in his Kavi Kalpadaru openly proclaims his indebtedness to Sanskrit poetics for serving as a model for his own retires and poetics in Braj Bhasha. He says, I Chindamani have carefully considered the precepts of books written in the language of the gods, that is Sanskrit, and I am expounding a theory of vernacular literature. Similar is the observation of Bikhari Das, another great rhetorician in uh, Braj Bhasha. He says, I studied the Sanskrit texts Chandraloka and Kavi Prakasha, I understood them and made their ideas beautiful in the vernacular. These examples corroborate the argument that the literary theorists of vernacular poetics always looked up to Sanskrit poetics as a model. This does not imply that vernacular traditions of poetics did not introduce anything new on their own. On the other hand, the point I want to emphasize here is that Sanskrit literary science was indeed a great source of influence and inspiration for the treatises of literary science in vernacular languages in India. An important Sanskrit literary theoretician who we need to mention before we close this lecture on the state of Sanskrit poetics in the medieval period is Jagannatha Pandita. Jagannatha holds an important position uh, in Sanskrit poetics as the last literary theoretician uh, to be celebrated across the Sanskrit cosmopolis. According to scholars like Pollock, uh, Jagannatha marks a historical endpoint in a number of important ways. If it can be said that his ontogeny recapitulate, recapitulated the phylogeny of Sanskrit literary culture, this was probably the last such case. We know of no later poet who circumambulated uh, the quarters of Sanskrit cosmopolitan space. Jagannatha was a scholar from what we now call Telangana. His father, Peru Bhatta, was also his teacher and mentor. A member of the court of Emperor Shah Jahan, Jagannatha was known in literary circles as the emperor of poets. He is believed to have received the title King of Scholars, Pandita Raja, from the emperor himself. Along with the strong patronage of the emperor, he was also supported by many other princely houses for whom he often wrote prasastis or eulogies. He could also be viewed as an example of the cultural syncretism of this time. Uh, having married a Muslim woman and becoming an integral part of the Mughal courts. His most famous literary work is Pamini Vilasa or the Games of Beautiful Women. 
In many of his treatises on poetics, Jagannatha quotes from this work to illustrate the literary concepts that he was discussing. Rasagangathara, his magnum opus in the field of literary theory, is often considered a curious mixture of modernity and tradition. In Rasagangathara, Jagannatha effectively employed the framework of Vedanta to understand literary categories. Unlike uh, many of his contemporaries, such as Jiva Goswamin, who invented a new rasa called Bhagavad In this lecture, we were trying to understand the state of Sanskrit poetics in the medieval phase. The phase which we call the medieval phase of Sanskrit poetics spans from the 13th century to 17th century. We can safely consider the 17th century as the point at which the medieval phase of Sanskrit poetics ends. The 17th century is considered the closing period of the medieval period precisely because it marks the beginning of colonialism, uh, thereby inaugurating a new phase for literary theory. The criticism that was conventionally directed against Sanskrit poetics in the medieval phase was that uh, there was nothing worth mentioning in Sanskrit literary theory during the medieval period. But scholars like Yigal Bronner, we have seen, shows us that Sanskrit poetics in the medieval phase was innovative and really powerful. Uh, it is important to note that at this juncture, despite the strong influence of vernacular literature during this phase, Sanskrit Kavi Shastra in fact continued to produce uh, new treatises, thereby, thereby ensuring the continuum of its great lineage dating back to the 7th century CE. Sanskrit poetics during the medieval phase is particularly characterized by two events. One, a methodological change in the approach of uh, Sanskrit Kavi Shastra. And the second one, the emergence of uh, vernacular literature and poetics. The literary theoreticians in the medieval phase attempted to constitute a new relation with their past. That is to say, Instead of inventing any radically new critical concept like Thwani or Vakrokti in the previous era, they directed their energy mainly to critically examine the views of their predecessors and to answer the old questions in new ways. To mark their departure from their predecessors in terms of their uh, mode of operation and views, these new poeticians often identified themselves as Navyas or new intellectuals in contrast to their predecessors who they often call Prachinas. The second major point that we discussed in this connection was the emergence of vernacular poetics and the influence that Sanskrit poetics exercised upon vernacular literary theory. Here, the important observation that we need to remember is that of G. N. Devi. According to Devi, the impact of Sanskrit poetics upon vernacular poetics was so strong that the vernacular languages failed to produce an indigenous tradition of Kavya Shastra independent of their Sanskritic counterpart. Devi observes that the ideal temporal sequence of events in the medieval phase should have been the decline of Sanskrit as a literary language and the emergence of the Bhashas and consequently the decline of Sanskrit poetics and then the emergence of Pasha criticism. But Devi observes that this logical sequence of events did not in fact happen. The two most important deviations from this logical sequence that Devi notes are these. First, Sanskrit poetics does not show signs of decline several centuries after the emergence of Pasha criticism. And second, no significant criticism in the Pasha tradition is in evidence. In this context, I also like to point out that I do not mean to argue that vernacular traditions of poetics did not introduce anything new on their own. On the other hand, the point I want to emphasize here is that uh, Sanskrit literary science was indeed a great source of influence and inspiration for the treatises of literary science in vernacular languages. In this lecture, we also discussed Jagannatha and his importance in Sanskrit poetics. 
We saw that Jagannatha Pandita holds an important position in Sanskrit poetics as the last literary theoretician to be discussed and celebrated all over the Sanskrit cosmopolis.